Thanks for joining us today for a very important workshop. It's called Healthy Aging, Know Your Options. My name is Andy Williams, and I'm the Executive Director of Community in Crisis, a small grassroots organization based in Burnersville, New Jersey, that is working hard to prevent substance use disorder by raising prevention education about the danger of substances and also helping people in recovery achieve a healthy and wholesome life. Today's workshop is called Healthy Aging, Know Your Options. I'm gonna share my screen with you so that I can talk you through some slides before you join our panel of experts um, who will talk you through some alternative approaches to pain management. So, as I said, I work for Community in Crisis and our mission is to lead and unite communities to reduce the incidence and consequences of the misuse of substances. And we do that through education, uh, prevention and holistic support whilst trying to reduce stigma associated with uh, substance use disorder. So as I said, our workshop today is called Healthy Aging and Know Your Options. So where are we at the moment? Uh, it's the number one public health crisis back in 2019 and remains so today, even during the pandemic of the coronavirus, which has really distracted us from so many other things going on around our lives. But today I'm here to refocus you on things that are really important to keep you safe and healthy. Um, in 2017, an average of 130 people died a day from an opioid overdose. Um, so it's still pretty shocking figures going on and it's increasing at the moment during the pandemic. Um, there were over 70,000 drug overdose deaths in the US in 2017. And last year, over three, uh, almost 4 million prescriptions were written. Over 15,000 Narcan deployments were made. Narcan is the life-saving antidote uh, when there is an overdose and more than 3,000 suspected overdose deaths last year. So the numbers are shocking. Um, I just want to read some startling facts out to you, um, as it may pertain to you um, or the people that you care for. Um, about one third of Medicare patients, um, which is nearly 12 million people, uh, were prescribed opioids or painkillers by their doctors. Um, in 2015, it was shown that 2.7 million Americans over the age of 50 abused uh, prescription painkillers. And by abused, I mean that they took painkillers that were not prescribed to them or they took more than their doctor had recommended. And the ho sorry, hospitalization rate due to opioid use has, uh, for those over 65 and over, has grown five times in the past two decades. Um, two thirds of teens report that they got them from their friends or family. Um, so that could be us if we're keeping them hand, you know, very available in our homes. And just know this fact, three out of four heroin users began with prescription pills. So the objectives today of this workshop is to um, try and help you prevent dependency and uh, leading to addiction. Um, to try and help you reduce the supply of opioids in your own home and in the community at large. Um, understand the risks associated with, uh, with opioids and the signs and symptoms, et cetera. And also um, to more than anything, increase your understanding of what your alternatives are. That's really important. And we'll be getting to that shortly. So let's just talk a little bit about what you can do about all of this. So store your medicines in a safe place. I mean, we have to have them sometimes and they're prescribed to us and that's perfectly fine and perfectly necessary. But try and store them somewhere safely and know how many you've got. If you don't need them anymore, if your prescription, um, you, you're not feeling the pain anymore or they're um, expired, get rid of them because um, they can still be um, diverted by somebody visiting your home like a cleaner or um, a painter who's in to paint your house at that time. So get rid of them if you don't need them and um, which really help the people that come into your house who might be uh, looking out for them and prone to uh, abusing them. And spread the word, talk to your children, grandchildren, friends, family, neighbors about what you've learned today so that we can help more people than just those listening in today. And just regardless of the reasons for needing to go and see a doctor, um, here are some tips. 
bring a list of your medications with you. So, cause you, he's, he or she's bound to ask you what you're taking at the moment and write down any questions you have for your doctor, because often we forget when we walk in that doctor's office. Um, some ways around that is to bring a friend, um, trusted friend or family member with you who can help you remember and ask the right questions and also remember what the doctor's told you. And if you are prescribed opioids, ask her or him what your options are, what alternative approaches are there to managing your pain. Um, here's some facts on opioids. You know, opioids, not, we, we don't all know what they are. They're commonly known as Percocet, Vicodin, Hydrocodone, uh, names like that. So check the label. Um, opioids can be used to treat uh, moderate or severe pain. And they're often prescribed as we saw in those stats. Uh, and they are an important part of treatment, uh, but they do come with some serious risks, which you need to know about. Um, the use of opioids can have a number of side effects, such as tolerance, dependency, um, constipation, uh, increased sensitivity to pain, not decreased, uh, depression, and so on. And if you have a history in your family of substance use disorder, uh, a history of drug use or misuse, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, make sure the doctor knows that because um, that's something very important for her or him to know when prescribing you your medications. Um, so lastly, talk to your doctor about ways that you can manage your pain that don't involve opioids. Um, some of these options may actually work better than others. And some patients in studies have shown that their um, satisfaction in pain management is just as effective, if not more so, than if they were to use opioids. And if your doctor does feel that opioids are necessary, ask her or him to provide the lowest dose possible for only three to five days. Um, hopefully you don't need more than that. And five days has been shown to be a critical turning point in uh, some people's dependency and potential addiction. And many over-the-counter medications have strong agents in them, which can work just as well as a prescription. And these are things like ibuprofen and naproxen and so on. Uh, so thank you for listening. I'm now going to hand you over to Brenda Miller, our program coordinator. Thank you very much. I'm Brenda Miller and I work with Community in Crisis as their senior education coordinator. I had the opportunity to interview five professionals of disciplines other than traditional medicine with regards to pain management. I asked each of them to describe their discipline with regards to managing pain without medication, as well as how to find a good professional and what kind of coverage you might expect from insurance. Please take some time to listen to what these professionals have to say. You may be surprised at some of their responses. Uh, I'm Dr. Brian Wallace from Somerset Hills Chiropractic located in Bernardsville, New Jersey. Uh, I've been a practicing chiropractor over the last 10 years, and I truly love what I do. Uh, I, I get to help people feel better. And in this aspect, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, how we can keep you from having to resort to some type of medication that may not be in your best interest long term. So as a chiropractor, most people know chiropractors for musculoskeletal pain, um, low back pain, neck pain, headaches, and a myriad of other pain or symptoms um, related to the musculoskeletal system. But in the bigger picture, what we do as chiropractors is we look at people's spine and we compare it to normal. And the closer your body is to what is considered normal, not only do you feel better, but in the bigger picture, your body works better. Um, as a chiropractor, we deal mostly with the spine and your spine houses your spinal cord. And your spinal cord is your nervous system. And the nervous system is the most important system in your body. It controls and coordinates every other system in your body. So when that pathway is open and communicating properly, your body works at its peak. And if there's some type of misalignment or irritation to the spine, it will have an effect on the nervous system and therefore creating either pain, 
symptoms, and in other cases, it can create dysfunction. So that's kind of what we do. We encourage patients uh, through natural health. Uh, we talk a lot about diet. We talk a lot about exercise. We talk about uh, what's in between your ears. Having a positive mental outlook on life will have a huge impact on your health and your symptoms and your pain. So if, you, if you're looking at um, minimizing pain, start looking at the bright side of life, looking at a glass half full, because there's studies show that people who have a positive outlook on life, an uh, optimist lives on average seven years longer than a pessimist. Crazy, but just changing your attitude makes all the difference. So we deal with patients who have had acute pain, um, some type of injury. We see obviously patients who have been in car accidents and things like that, which is more of an acute issue or a trauma related fall, uh, sports related injury. We do see a lot of those types of problems, but we also see um, the, in maybe a more of a elderly population, chronic problems, issues that have been going on for a long, a long time that progressively get worse. And as the chiropractor, what we encourage patients is always start from a least invasive approach and move towards a more invasive approach. So less invasive, invasive approaches are chiropractic, massage therapy, physical therapy, acupuncture, uh, yoga, meditation, things like that. And then if those areas don't help relieve your symptoms of pain, then you can move into more of the uh, invasives, trying different medications and other therapies, the injections and things like that. And, and then finally, if things don't can uh, improve with those types of therapies, you can end up with some type of surgical procedure, uh, which obviously is a last resort. We always encourage that as a last resort because once they start taking out things, uh, you can't put them back in. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we always encourage that. And as chiropractors, uh, about eight or nine out of 10 people will develop lower back pain at some point in their life. And eight out of 10 people will develop some type of neck or upper back pain throughout their life. So there's a very good chance that you will have some type of musculoskeletal type of issue throughout your life. And seeking chiropractic care or a, a different alternative modality First, you have a much better chance at resolving that issue without the use of drugs, medication, or surgery. So obviously that's all dependent on the patient. Uh, at, at whenever somebody comes into our office specifically, before we do any type of treatment whatsoever, uh, it's required a full exam, a history, proper consultation, um, and any necessary x-rays. We as a chiropractor in our office do have x-rays on site. Uh, so we can do that because we want to make sure we're doing what's best for the patient. Uh, it's not just um, we want to help you feel better as quickly as possible. That's our number one goal, but we want to make sure we're doing what's in your best interest. And a majority of the patients that we see uh, within one to two weeks will tell us that they notice a significant difference. Uh, if it's a more chronic, if, it, if there's a lot more arthritic conditions going on and something that's a little bit more tricky, um, sometimes it's up to a month, but never more than a month. And most, most patients notice a significant difference in the first one to two weeks. Uh, anyone with Medicare, uh, chiropractic care is covered very well. You get up to 30 visits a year, which is a tremendous amount of visits um, to be covered by Medicare uh, patient. And so Medicare patients co coverage is very good. And if you, do, if you do not have Medicare and it's some type of um, insurance, then it's totally dependent on the policy. Most policies do have some type of chiropractic coverage. Chiropractic is becoming more and more mainstream um, today. And that, that's always a good thing because it, it prevents people from having to seek more invasive procedures. Uh, finding a good chiropractor um, can be tricky, just like with any other medical professional. Uh, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And the first thing I would do is ask around. 
ask around to your friends, to your family members, or people who live within your vicinity to see if you can get a recommendation. See if you can get uh, a, a referral from somebody who's already had a good experience. And once you do that, the next thing I would do is look them up online. Uh, most today, if uh, you have the ability to access people online, you are gonna see reviews, you're gonna see um, how they rate uh, towards uh, in comparison to others. And now that's not the tell all whether or not somebody's uh, gonna be good for you. Um, and then call them up. If everything looks good online and you've got a referral from somebody that you trust, give them a call, ask them about their procedures, ask them to talk to the doctor. Uh, if anyone ever calls this office and would like to speak to me about what's going on with them before they make an appointment, I'm more than happy to do that um, at, at no cost to the patient, just to help them feel more comfortable and make sure they know that they are in the right place. So if you can do those three things and uh, you feel still feel good about it, you're probably in the right place. I am Christy McCarthy. I have been a physical therapist now for oh, over 25 years. I've currently been working in the same physical therapy office for just over 10 years. So some of you may have had experience with physical therapy and some of you may not. Physical therapy is, um, I would say the background of it is based in Western medicine. So we are very much aligned with your doctor's recommendations and everyday healthcare that you would find here in the US. Um, a physical therapist is a licensed professional. We have all gone to some sort of postgraduate schooling, graduate school, currently, if you graduate from physical therapy school, you graduate with a doctorate degree. Uh, it takes usually three to four more years than just your undergraduate degree. Um, we are required to keep up with continuing education. So we are abreast of current scientific um, studies that help support some of the things that we do. And we try to um, you know, make sure that it has a good basis in science for why we do the things that we do. Physical therapy runs on the continuum of the full life. So we do see infants and school age children. We also see young adults, kids who have sports injuries, and we see um, middle-aged adults who might have sustained an injury uh, for whatever reason. And we also see the elderly population. That happens to be the area that I specialize in um, definitely work with a lot of the frail elderly or people who just want to maintain how they're doing in life or improve upon their status. Um, we see the area of physical therapy that I work in is outpatient orthopedic therapy. So we deal with the musculoskeletal system. By that, I mean Musculo meaning the muscles and obviously skeleton, the bones of the system. There are other physical therapists that are based in neurology. A neuro physical therapist would help you if you had Parkinson's or you've had a stroke. Um, we do treat some kinds of neurological issues in my clinic. Uh, I'm also trained in a specialized area of physical therapy called vestibular therapy, which deals with balance issues or balance dysfunctions that are stemming from issues of the inner ear. Pain is the primary reason that we have patients come to see us in our clinic. So if pain is impacting your function, if pain is making it difficult for you to live the life that you want to live, that is a great reason to come to physical therapy. Um, you might have pain because of a chronic issue, and by a chronic issue, this could be arthritis, an arthritic knee, or an arthritic hip, or arthritic shoulder. You might have issues of pain that are stemming from issues in your spine, if you have spinal stenosis, 
or you have a degenerative disc in your neck or your low back, that can also create some chronic pain issues. We also deal with patients who have acute pain issues. And by acute pain, I mean pain that has started up maybe in the past few weeks to last couple months. That would be considered acute pain. Chronic pain is pain that you've been battling for months to years. Um, so acute pain, that might have come because you started a new exercise program or you suddenly had to do a lot of heavy lifting or you, you engaged in some heavy gardening and you've developed an overuse injury. Um, that would be an issue that we certainly could help you with. We also see patients who are post-op surgery. So if you've unfortunately fallen and sustained a wrist fracture or an ankle fracture or a hip fracture, um, you would probably be referred to some sort of physical therapy for that. If you've had a, a total knee replacement or a partial knee replacement or a hip replacement or you've had rotator cuff surgery, all of these are definitely cases that an orthopedic doctor would be referring you to physical therapy. And so in all of those cases, chronic, acute, or post-surgery, you're likely to have pain and physical therapy is designed to help you to try to manage that pain. Um, how do we do that? So what happens if you come to physical therapy? You would come to our cl clinic and you would undergo an evaluation. During the evaluation, we try to look at a patient in a very holistic manner, meaning, if you have low back pain, I'm not gonna address simply that small area of the back that is causing your pain. I'm going to attend to that, but I'm also gonna look for what are the causes of this person's low back pain? Is it stemming from an overuse injury of the muscle? Is it because unfortunately they've had poor posture for many years now and that has worn down on the skeletal system and created some changes in the discs that we need to address? Is there low back pain related to maybe a leg length discrepancy that hasn't been observed yet or, or problem solved? Is it related to a scoliosis of the back? So we try to look at the entire person. As we say, it's sort of a chain of events. It's not just one area that hurts. It's related to all the parts above and below. Um, same thing if you came in with a shoulder pain, I would be evaluating, is it your neck that is referring pain to your shoulder? Is it your shoulder because of a postural abnormality? Is it your shoulder because of weakness or stiffness in an area of the shoulder? How do we treat the pain? Uh, we have many options in front of us. So the simplest thing that we might do would be to recommend that you use heat or ice. I want to tell you that ice is your friend. <laughs> Ice is a very nice way to calm down an inflammation of a body part. Um, it's either going to help you or it's going to do nothing, but it really can't hurt you unless you give yourself frostbite or freezer burn. So you do need to be careful and listen to your body, but 10 minutes of ice on an achy part is, is never a bad idea. Um, if you come to our clinic and we felt that you would benefit from a modality called ultrasound, we might use a small machine, contains a little sound head that creates vibratory waves and that friction in your tissue is used to warm up the injured tissue. So when I warm up a tissue, I help bring blood supply to the area. That helps with the healing. It helps to flush out any toxins that we might have from cellular death from the injury. I might be using ultrasound to prepare a tendon or a muscle for stretching. It's just a way to deep heat something. You may have also heard that sometimes we use electrical stimulation. That sounds scary, but it isn't scary. Electrical stimulation is a way to actually tell the brain to stop sensing pain. It's a way to block our pain pathways 
and to give them a different message. So instead of constantly saying pain, they now are feeling a different sensation. They even have on the market uh, portable small units of electrical uh, stimulation that's called a TENS unit. So it's one that you could use at home and you have your own electrodes and we can teach you how to use that for a chronic pain issue that, that might be helped by that. We've begun uh, in the past few years utilizing something called kinesio tape. You may have seen kinesio tape on some of our um, Olympic athletes or on a, a local athlete at your local high school. Kinesio tape is another way for us to give your pain pathway a different uh, sensation so that it's not constantly saying pain in your brain. It can help make things feel a little bit better. If we found that a source of your pain was related to a stiffness in your joint, we are trained in joint mobilization. So I might need to loosen up a shoulder joint with some gentle motions to try to gain flexibility in that joint to help restore more normal motion. Uh, if I found that you had tension in some muscles or some muscle knots, we utilize massage for that reason. So we might find a trigger point and we might work at trying to release that trigger point and restore more normal um, muscle motion. Finally, the other ways that we might approach pain for physical therapy, if I found that you had a joint that was um, too tight, I would, or a muscle that's too tight, I would certainly address this with the proper ways of stretching. We would teach you how to stretch. And oftentimes pain is related to weakness. So one of the major areas of physical therapy is teaching you the correct ways to strengthen your muscles. By visit number six, I absolutely expect a patient to tell me that they think that we are on the right path. If I haven't heard that by about visit number six, I need to rethink what I'm doing or perhaps refer you back to your doctor. The first person to ask would be your friends. Perhaps some of them have come to our physical therapy clinic or ask your doctor. If you have uh, physical therapy, our clinic does take insurance. So if you have Medicare, um, we have to work in conjunction with your doctor. We need to work under a prescription from your doctor. If you don't have Medicare, we are direct access, meaning you can come to our clinic without a doctor's prescription. If we feel you need care from a doctor, we will refer you to a doctor. It, like normal insurance, if you have a deductible, that would have to be met. There are co-pays associated with a visit if that is part of your insurance. And then some insurances cap the amount of therapy visits that you can have in a year. So um, you certainly could get started with your insurance. And we do try, one of the things that we try to do is to teach you how to help yourself. So my favorite day is the day I say bye. I hope I see you in ShopRite because I want you to feel empowered that you can help yourself. I don't want you always having to come back to me for your pain. I want to teach you how to make yourself feel better and empowered by that. Uh, my name is Jennifer Husnick. I am a licensed massage therapist. I've um, been working in the field of massage for about 25 years now. I, um, I guess in 20, the 25 years I've been doing massage, I have been working about most of the years, except for the first two years, I've been working with doctors and doctor's offices. So um, the type of massage that I do is a little more medical, um, not so much spa, fluffy kind of massage, which is also very nice. Um, but my type of massage is more specific to injuries, um, pain management, um, which also helps to relax the person, um, de-stress, and um, boost your immune system. So um, that is very important for this time, specifically with 
uh, with all the things that are happening, viruses and things like that, um, boosting your immune system, keeping healthy, keeping de-stressed. Um, and it all goes, it all goes with, with, the, um, with the massage therapy. Because touch actually releases pain relieving endorphins throughout your body, um, that is very helpful in relieving pain. Just knowing somebody is caring for you, knows what they're doing, and the intent that we have as a massage therapist, uh, therapist is to help you feel better. Sometimes that is that goes a, a long way. Um, also, when we're working on certain muscle groups that are in spasm or causing pain, just bringing that blood flow to the surface, pushing out all the uh, metabolic waste and toxins that are stuck in the muscle to help release all of that, um, that helps the pain as well. It, it can be a little bit uncomfortable at times, but we always say it's kind of the good pain and um, that, that's how we know we're working on an area that really needs it. Mm -hmm. So day to day, you know, headaches or I slept wrong and I can't turn my neck, that kind of thing. Um, very good for specific injuries like that. Because I work in a chiropractor's office, we work on a lot of chronic pain as well. So um, getting massage on a regular basis can help people who have like chronic issues with their lower back, their, maybe their muscles are um, weak. And so other muscle groups have to tighten to counteract the weak areas. So we work on the other muscles, get them to loosen up and everything kind of goes um, back to where it should be. So it, it helps in you know, any which way, it, it, um, chronic or acute injuries. A lot of the patients, that's their number one question. When am I going to feel better? Um, everybody's very different in how their body receives and um, reacts to massage. So most of the time, there's some slight difference right away. Um, and again, I think that's because of the endorphins that, that touch it, getting touched, you know, and that caring, um, caring for somebody they're feeling that and that's, you know, that's a big part of healing. Um, but then as they, you know, some, some people, their muscles are very, very tight for a very long amount of time. And they're, I always say they're kind of like a stubborn, uh, naughty three-year-old. They don't listen sometimes, the muscles. So you have to keep going um, consecutively to get it worked on. So you relax the muscle, it, it kind of listens and then it might just tighten up again and say, uh, we're not gonna listen to this therapist. And then you go back in, you get it worked on again. Everybody's slightly different in what their body can handle as well. Like the, um, the deep tissue, not everybody can handle deep tissue. And you have to kind of go with what your, your patient or client can handle. Um, there's some people I wanna just get in there and just work on those, on those, those spasms, but immediately I can tell their muscle tissue just tightens right up. So I need to back off and just go easy, easy, easy. So, um, but most people can feel some type of difference early, early on in their massages. You would wanna look for somebody obviously who has a license. Um, in the state of New Jersey, it, it is required now. Dates differ, you know, everything is, is different depending on what state you're living in. Um, I would also look for somebody, well, it depends on what kind of massage you want too. There's so many different kinds. You know, if you're looking for a very relaxing spa massage, they still have to be licensed in a spa. You know, you can go that route. If you're looking for something specific to an injury rehab or something like that, you'd want to go ask a physical therapist. They might know. I, I have a couple of physical therapists that will refer their patients to me for massage. Um, ask a chiropractor. Um, like I said, I've always worked with chiropractors and I've actually worked with a group of neurosurgeons. Um, you can always ask around, you know, your other medical professionals where they would, where they would want to send you. We found in our office that there are some insurance plans that will cover, um, I believe like a 30 minute session as long as they're getting an adjustment with it. It's considered trigger point therapy. 
most insurances do not cover massage, unfortunately. Um, I think it's because insurance companies can't really, they can't really keep track of where the person's going to get the massage. There's no like big database of like, okay, all these therapists, you know, you could take your script and go and get that, get it covered. Um, I also think it's kind of um, a blessing that they're not paying for it because once insurance companies start to um, pay for things, they start to dictate what you can do or what you can't do. And, you know, massage is, is so specific to the person giving it that it's hard to say, well, you can't, you know, the insurance company says I can only work on this trigger point for X amount of minutes and then I have to go somewhere else or I have to do, you know, something different. So we as massage therapists have our own style and technique, what works best. And I think insurance companies might end up um, trying to dictate a little bit more what we can do. Hi, my name is Keith Kimmick. I'm a licensed and board certified acupuncturist. Uh, my office is in New Jersey, uh, in Burnsville, New Jersey. It's called Phoenix Rising Acupuncture, right in the center of downtown Burnsville. So acupuncture is a holistic healthcare system that focuses on uh, manipulating and balancing your body's uh, what we call chi energy. This is your life force. This is what um, animates. Within our bodies, this chi energy, or some people will call it life force, life energy, um, flows throughout our body. And our health is influenced by the quality, the quantity, and the balance of this chi energy within our body. Um, so any disruption of the chi flow and balance within the body can cause a variety of symptoms. Um, one of those that we're talking about today is pain. Um, so this disruption or imbalance of the chi energy can be caused by a number of different things, such as uh, physical injury, uh, emotional trauma, chemical, physical, or emotional stress, um, environmental factors like cold and dampness, um, and other things that can be internally influenced, such as uh, or internal causes, such as blood stasis and what we also say um, chi vacuity. An acupuncture will an acupuncturist will help to regulate and balance uh, these, this chi energy within the body. Um, the most common way that this is done is with the insertion of fine sterile metal needles uh, into the skin at specific acupuncture points. Um, there are also other ways that acupuncturists will uh, manipulate this chi energy in the body. Um, some people are familiar with uh, what we call electroacupuncture. There's also, uh, in recent years, what we call laser acupuncture. Um, there's also other methods um, called moxibustion, which uses um, uh, warming herbs. There's also cupping, uh, and also even massage can be one way of um, helping to balance and um, manipulate this chi energy within our bodies. Sometimes, you know, in Chinese medicine, um, longer illness means longer treatment times. So somebody who has acute pain or an acute illness typically will resolve faster using acupuncture than somebody with a chronic issue. Um, chronic issues can sometimes take uh, months or even years to correct, where sometimes an acute issue can even be remedied within one session, typically not one session, but can happen within that. Uh, and usually just takes a few weeks or months even. But um, so the shorter you've had the condition, usually the faster it can be resolved. 
you know, there's a few places you can start at least to find out whether the acupuncturist is licensed or board, board certified. Um, here in New Jersey, um, our licensing board is through the Division of Consumer Affairs. So if you went to the state's website and did a license lookup, for your practitioner, you would find out um, the status of their license and whether or not they've had any complaints or issues against them. Um, there's also a national board certification, which I am also. Um, and for that, we use uh, a website called nccaom.org. That's the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. Acupuncture reimbursement through insurance varies by state by state and also uh, plan to plan. So I would always uh, recommend that somebody who's interested in um, pursuing acupuncture contact their insurance company and explain the condition that they're looking to have treated. Um, being that acupuncture covered varies, some conditions will be covered for people and other conditions uh, will not be. So it all depends upon the plan and the coverage that you have. My name is Katie Sulis and I am a registered nurse. But in 2013, I found my way from injury, a running injury to yoga. And in yoga, I found not just healing from the injury, but so much more. So um, many of us are very aware of yoga's stress relieving capabilities, but fewer of us know about its role in pain relief. There is so much research right now going on and um, in the past about yoga and the benefits to the body. And considering that yoga was created thousands of years ago, and has withstood the test of time, it's worthy to take a really good look at it because we have a lot of trends in exercise and diet that don't last long, but yoga is the one thing that has stuck around. There's various studies that have shown that yoga is effective in pain relief. They've shown that yoga-based mindfulness med meditation can benefit people who suffer from chronic conditions like migraines, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, headaches, back pain, and even more. It's also effective in preventing pain. And in 2016, the Journal of American Medical Association report showed that the proactive use of exercise like gentle yoga can provide a greater reduction of back, back pain recurrence, for example, over more commonly prescribed methods like belts and orthotics and rest. So it's important and growing in, its, in physicians' awareness of how much it can help their clients. Um, the best way to unlearn chronic stress patterns is to give your mind and your body a healthier way to respond. The thing about yoga is that it's 100% self-motivated. So it's not going to work um, unless you want it to and unless you want to take the time to do it. Yoga is the type of medicine where individuals can transform that thought of, I have chronic pain and stress to I have chronic healing. And that changing of the words allows for a changing in the perception of pain. Our bodies and our minds have built in healing responses that are just as powerful as protective pain and stress responses. Whether it's meditation on gratitude or a relaxation pose that puts the body and mind at ease, or even breathing exercises that strengthen the flow of breath and, and blood flow through the body, all of it has the benefit of bringing a person back home to a natural sense of, of well-being. So the yoga approach for 
pain management works. And it starts off working head to toe is setting eyes. It's called drishti. So when I set my eyes, when I have a focused thought that I am going to heal my body, that can translate into my mind that I, I'm really focused on doing this and I'm going to make it happen. Move down to nose, our breath. Breath is the one, well, there's several, but we do it involuntarily. Our body just breathes for us, but we also have a voluntary component to it. We can breathe on our own. We can control it. We can hold our breath and swim a distance underwater, or we can increase the, the flow of our breath, increase the rate when we're panting, running, exercising hard. Um, with chronic pain, we're often taking more shallow breaths. And they're usually a little bit faster than normal. So with yoga, we focus on taking a longer inhale, a fuller inhale, using not just an, a quicker shallow breath, it's really just the top of your lung that's filling. But in yoga, we focus on filling the entire lung cavity with breath. And then exhaling, pushing all that breath out. That shallow breath that we take when we're in pain is a protective mechanism. We're physically immobilizing an area where we're feeling our pain. And when we do that, our body interprets this stress response and then sets off like a waterfall of cortisol flow of um, reacting to stress and has effects all over our body. When we bring our attention in yoga to the controlled breath, the prolonged inhale and deep long exhale, we are able to increase the amount of oxygen we physically bring in. This is a vital energy. It's called pranayama breathing. And it, the encouragement of the full inhalation and a prolonged complete exhalation is proven to relax skeletal muscles. So in, in most chronic pain conditions, whether it be upper or low back pain, tension, headaches, whatever the cause is, there is a decrease of circulation to muscles and organs. And we make this worse when we have a sedentary lifestyle, a lack of exercise, poor posture, and even staying inside, staying indoors um, has shown, actually it's shown that our bones demineralize due to inadequate exposure to the sun, which has to do with the way we use vitamin D. So in yoga, we use postures, also known as asana. There's one of the questions, like how long does this take? It takes as long as you give it. So when I come to yoga and work on postures and I'm flexing muscles I haven't used in a while, the muscles get sore and that's to be expected. If I commit to a regular practice, say three days a week, the strength improves, the pain decreases, the increased blood flow heading to all the parts of the body, not just the part that's affected by pain, it improves. It's not overnight. It's not, there's not a due date when it happens. It's a gradual process. And the people who practice yoga report not just feeling better, but sleeping better, driving better, better mood. And the interpretation of pain is lessened. So there's less suffering. It doesn't necessarily fix the problem. If you have herniated discs, for instance, if you have irritable bowel syndrome, it doesn't cure it, 
but it makes it easier to bear. And I think that is much more effective in the long run in helping chronic pain than any other method that there is. So yoga nidra, you're, as I stated earlier, you're able to find a lot of yoga nidra scripts and guided meditations through Google and YouTube. There's also meditation apps like Insight Timer that offer guided yoga nidra experiences to do at home, on your bed, on the couch, on a comfortable mat on the floor with pillows, bolsters, and blankets for support. Now, many senior centers, YMCAs, JCCs, hospitals, cancer centers, and township recreation departments offer community yoga. They offer chair yoga. They offer gentle yoga. Many times they supply uh, props like yoga straps, yoga blocks, the chair, the mat, uh, and even blankets. So it is definitely a, a place to look for to, um, to see gentle and yoga nidra or yin yoga, which is another gentle type of yoga. Practitioners are certified and at these locations, they have their proof of certification. Most instructors spend hundreds of hours in training. Yoga Alliance is the gold standard and have set criteria for what the yoga training looks like in terms of what the instructor has studied about anatomy, physiology, and proper body anatomic alignment. This information is also seen, it, the yoga teacher will advertise themselves through their personal biography. Um, yoga studios that offer gentle yoga, yoga nidra, yin yoga, always have a cost associated. I personally, don't know of any yoga studios that take insurance. I have heard of employers that have a motivation for their employees to exercise and they'll pay for gym memberships. I have heard talk of insurance companies reimbursing people for things of this nature, but usually if it's not offered for free, then there is a cost that's not covered by insurance. Um, I am teaching through Zoom a chair yoga three days a week and would certainly love to have more people come and attend and have the ability for that. The problem these days for yoga instructors and teaching through Zoom is that we cannot see the student. So that giving a correction in anatomic alignment, I can't, I can't do it with my hands. And oftentimes when I'm teaching, I can't see below the waist to know if both feet are at 12 o'clock or, you know, for me, I stand with one, my right toe pigeons out to the right. So I can't see that as an instructor on the screen, which makes teaching during the pandemic a bit more difficult. And having an awareness of your body and where it lies in space is something that grows with practice. So a little bit more difficult during the pandemic, not impossible. And breathing techniques for sure, different yogic breathing techniques can be studied and done on Google and right, right in your home in front of your screen. And it's a perfect way to start. So many people don't want to exercise or do this sort of thing in front of anybody else because they feel weird. And it's completely about self-motivation at this point to take the time and, and do the research and practice the breathing and sit in a chair, practice poses, find what you need and follow the instructor, but be your own teacher. Thanks so much for joining us today. For more information, please email us at cicsenioreducation at gmail.com. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have and provide additional resources. Be well and stay safe.